64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Hello, and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor S.F. Walker. I'm here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk, their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. And today, we look at the disappearance of the universe. Straight talk about illusions, past lives, religion, sex, politics, and the miracle of forgiveness by Gary Renard. In this video, we discover that most of what the world thinks as the wisdom of the ages is actually full of it. The divine intelligence of the universe is a phrase that's entirely worthy of having the plug pulled on it. You will learn that babies are not born with the clean slate or a natural tendency to focus on love and are then corrupted by the world. And you will find that if you are to return to God, then you have some work to do, not work in the world, but with your thoughts. Stick around till the end. I will share with you some tools I have in use that will help you tremendously in this game of life. Discover a way to find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. I will share some tools to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. Perhaps the most overlooked error of all religions and philosophies, including the New Age models, is the failure to understand that although doing things like thinking positively, being in the now, saying prayers, affirmations, denying negative thoughts, and listening to famous speakers may have a temporarily helpful impact. They cannot release that which is locked in the deep canyons of your unconscious mind. Your unconscious mind, which you are completely oblivious to, or else it would not be unconscious is under the domination of a sick thought system that is shared on both a collective and individual level by everyone who comes to the false universe, or else they wouldn't have come here in the first place. This will remain the case until your thoughts are examined, correctly forgiven, released to the Holy Spirit and replaced by his thinking instead. Until then, your hidden beliefs will continue to dominate and assert themselves in a predetermined way. <clears throat> you have heard that the truth shall set you free. That is true. But nobody tells you what the truth is. You have heard that the kingdom of heaven is within you. That is also true, but nobody tells you how to get there. If they did, would you listen? You can lead a human to water, but you cannot make him or her drink. We will point you towards the water, but you will only drink it if you are ready for a spirituality like the truth is not of this universe. 
when Buddha said, I am awake, he meant he realized that he was not actually a participant in the illusion, but the maker of the entire illusion. One of the things he had realized was not only that the universe does not exist, but he didn't exist on any level other than the pure spirit. That's something that practically no one really wants to learn because it's terrifying to all people on an unconscious level because it means the relinquishment of any individuality or personal identity now and forever. This idea is well expressed by the models of quantum physics. Newtonian physics held that objects were real and outside of you with a separate existence. Now, quantum physics demonstrates that this is not true. The universe is not what you assume it to be. Everything that appears to exist is really inseparable thought. You can't even observe something without causing a change in it on a subatomic level. Everything is in your mind, including your own body. Now, the myth of living a perfect life in terms of behavior is self-defeating and unnecessary. All that is necessary is to be willing to receive correction. If nothing is outside of your mind, then to judge it is to grant it power over you, and to not judge it is to withdraw its power over you. Now, this certainly contributes to the end of your suffering. Pure non-dualism recognizes the authority of God so completely that it relinquishes all psychological attachment to anything that is not God, what some people have called the like-from-like like principle, which says that anything coming from God must be like Him. Pure non-dualism is not willing to compromise on this principle either. Rather, it says that anything that comes from God must be exactly like Him. Him. God could not create anything that is not perfect, or else he would not be perfect. The logic of that is flawless. If God is perfect and eternal, then by definition, anything he creates would also be perfect and eternal. The universe doesn't really want to wake up. The universe wants candy to make it feel better. But the candy is designed to bind you to the universe. Even on the level of form, Arabs and Jews, like Serbs and Muslims, are basically the same, which shows you how far people will go to be different. All ignorance is actually repression that exists in order to produce a particular effect for a specific reason. You think the universe is evolving, but it's really just spinning its wheels, repeating the same pattern over and over in different forms. The biggest advances are not made by being a great teacher. They're made by being a great student. Today, you and your friends believe in the existence of a trilogy, body, mind and spirit. The balance of all three is very important in your philosophy, but you will soon learn instead that the seemingly separated mind, which makes and uses bodies, must choose between the changeless and eternal reality of spirit, which is God and his kingdom, or 
the unreal and ever-changing universe of bodies, which includes anything that can be perceived, whether you appear to be in a body or not. This is a cornerstone of Jesus' message. You must be vigilant only for God. Now, this state of mind does not come all at once. It takes a lot of practice. You do not learn anything worthwhile overnight. Quote, I am the one who comes from what is whole. I was given from the things of my Father. Therefore, I say that if one is whole, one will be filled with light. But if one is divided, one will be filled with darkness. End of quote. In other words, to revisit an earlier point, you can have it both ways. You can't be a little bit whole any more than a woman can be a little bit pregnant. Your alliance must be undivided. You must be vigilant only for God. There are things the people of the world are capable of understanding at the dawn of this new millennium that they simply were not capable of understanding in the past. I told you before that the people of the world will never live in peace until the people of the world have inner peace. Like many people, there have been times in your life when you have been concerned about a possibility of going to hell. You didn't realize you were already there. There's an old Hebrew mystical tradition that says, hell is distance from God and heaven is closeness to him. A thought that is quite valid. Everything you behold in the universe of perception has one of two purposes for you to choose from. One purpose will keep you a prisoner, now the other will free you. Quote, a sense of separation from God is the only lack you really need to correct. End of quote. For example, Buddhism is modification of thought as opposed to a healing by the Holy Spirit. And Christianity and its approach is even one step further removed, being an attempt to modify the physical rather than the mental. Removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing cannot have opposite. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. <clears throat> you should remember that no matter how large it may appear to be, the ego is just a thought, and thoughts can be changed. People judge, feel good about it or bad about it, depending on whether they are projecting their guilt outward or inward. And then they punish themselves. They think they have won, but then their karma runs over their dogma. Remember, karma is just an effect. Now we're going to change the cause of everything by changing the mind. The effect on the level of the physical is not something to be concerned about because it isn't real. The real things you should be interested in are inner peace and returning to heaven. There's no statement that the world is more afraid to hear than this. I do not know the thing I am, and therefore I do not know what I am doing, where I am, 
or how to look upon the world or on myself. Yet in this learning is actually salvation born. And what you are will tell you of itself. Consciousness, the level of perception, was the first split introduced into the mind after the separation, making the mind a perceiver rather than a creator. Consciousness is correctly identified as the domain of the ego. Perception did not exist until the separation introduced degrees, aspects, and intervals. Spirit has no levels, and all conflict arises from the concept of levels. Now, if you really are love and not a person, then how can you love one person and not another? It wouldn't be possible. If you did that, then you wouldn't be love, would you? You would be something else. We have already talked about the first division in the mind, and along with it has come consciousness. Because of this, for the first time, you have a conscious choice to make. Before that, there was nothing to choose between, but now there are two possible responses to this idea of separation. That is what leads to the second division of the mind. We already said the seemingly separated mind appears to divide and subdivide. That symbolizes separation. But all the divisions are symbolic of the first few. Once you really do understand the first ones, you will understand them all as the same, despite appearances to the contrary. You have to remember that after the first division, heaven is just a memory. The motivation is fear, always ultimately traceable to the fear of God. The transtemporal, non-spatial, seemingly separated mind is in a paralyzing state of fear because of a punishment you believe is coming from God. So the ego convinces you that you need a defense without bothering to mention that the defense it offers is designed to ensure its own survival through your identity. In fact, if you look at the last four syllables of the world word individuality, you will see that they spell duality. And that is not just a semantic accident. The awesome magnitude of the painful shame and acute guilt in your mind, resulting from what you believe you have done, appear to require an immediate and complete escape. So you join with the ego. And then the incomprehensible power of your mind to make illusions as a perceiver rather than make spirit as a creator causes the method of your escape to become manifest. At this point, the ego, which you are now totally identified with, uses the ingenious but illusory method of projection to hurl the thought of separation out of your mind, and you, or at least the part of you that seems to have consciousness, appears to be projected right along with it. The law of forgiveness. You have to learn how to turn the tables on the ego. The only way to forgive what is within is to forgive what seems to be without. Understand up front that you will never be able to find your way out and experience your own innocence and divinity until you learn how to forgive 
everything you see around you. Until then, real escape is impossible. You don't have to change anybody's mind. And you don't have to change your world. All you have to do is change your mind about the world. God doesn't have to forgive me. I need to forgive myself by forgiving others instead of attacking them. Even if it is just a mental judgment and I do not say or do anything, an attack thought is still an attack thought. That's why I have to monitor my thoughts. Whether I attack or forgive, I do it to myself because these people aren't real anyway. They're just symbols of what is in my mind, just as I am a symbol in the collective mind. The world doesn't need God's forgiveness. People need to forgive themselves by forgiving the images they see. Let me tell you something once again. Repetition is not only perfectly all right, it is actually mandatory. That's the only way you can possibly learn a thought system, have it become a part of you, and then get to the point where you apply it automatically, eventually, without even thinking about it. That's why it's called practicing forgiveness. You practice over and over and over until it becomes second nature. You'll see the very best way to keep itself going is to suck you into reacting to the script so you make it real in your mind. The ego wants conflict and if you react with any negative emotion, that's conflict. It is your judgment that keeps the ego system alive, but your forgiveness will free it. So you have to be on your toes. To forgive means to give ahead of time. Forgive. One of the necessary changes in my thinking along the road to the ultimate experience was the acceptance of the idea that mind projects everything, observes its own projection from a different and seemingly separate point of view, and then interprets the perception as an external fact. The body, being itself an idea of separation, existed only in the mind as a way to experience separation. All my life, I had assumed that my eyes saw the world, my body felt it, and my brain then interpreted it. Doing this work was helping me comprehend that it was silly to think that the body's eyes really see, or that the brain could actually think or interpret things. The mind told my body what to see and feel and how to interpret what I was seeing and feeling. The body was simply a trick, a device within the ego mind that was designed to convince me my worldly life was the truth. Understand the cause of all human behavior. For example, in school, the bullies who had made other students' lives miserable might as well have been saying, we are cool and you are not. You are the guilty and wrong, not us. Now, the good students who could see the injustice in this, as well as the ludicrous nature of many other things in the world, were simply playing their own part in the victim-victimization cycle by seeing guilt in the perpetrators of the injustice instead of in themselves. He who would not forgive must judge, for he must justify his own failure to forgive. The Holy Spirit takes the very device ego made to protect itself and uses it to undo it. 
His devices can only be used for good. Do not worry about the results that may or may not be seen on the level of form. Be grateful for what forgiveness and the Holy Spirit are doing for you. You're telling the world, the word, the world about the bodily images that you see, that their behavior cannot have any effect on you. And if they cannot have any effect on you, then they don't really exist separately from you. Thus, there is no separation of any kind in reality, which brings us to the final major component of the attitude of forgiveness. Trust the Holy Spirit and choose His strength. Any kind of an upset from a mild discomfort to outright anger is a warning sign. It tells you that your hidden guilt is rising up from the recesses of your unconscious mind and coming to the surface. Think of that discomfort as the guilt that needs to be released by forgiving the symbol you associate with it. The real test of whether or not one was progressing on their chosen spiritual path had nothing to do with spiritual experiences. Indeed, the real questions one should be asking were, am I becoming more loving, more peaceful, more forgiving? Have I taken responsibility for my life? Do I understand the folly of judgment? That is how to tell if a path is working out for someone. Still, my particular mystical experiences were giving me joy especially because I had learned they were symbolic of my mind being forgiven as a result of forgiving the world. And there you have it, The Disappearance of Universe by Gary Renard. Please do help out. It is easy. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too and spread the word. Leave a comment and share your thoughts. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it, read, never stop learning, especially learning about yourself and nature. So gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and find out what actually motivates you, what innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management even further, do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. The links are in the description below. Thank you. Love and respect.